Thank you for joining us to view our Sunday morning worship experience through God's Word uh, on the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. We pray that you will be blessed by viewing uh, this video. Uh, and remember, uh, there's a whole host of videos on our YouTube channel that you can view at any time. If this is your first time, you can go back and catch up all you want to. It's kind of like binge viewing. Uh, but anyway, they're there for uh, your edification. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would keep us, lead us, and use us in your service for the edification of the body of Christ and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue to preach uh, the series uh, titled, Love is More Than Word. Love is More Than Words. Today's sermon is titled, God Abides in This, which answers the question, what is God doing? Our text is found in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. I'm reading the English Standard Version. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. It reads, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love perfects us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be a, the savior of the world and whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he is and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, for God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. At this point, it would be good for us to review what John has been saying about the basic truths uh, that God is love. This truth is revealed to us in the word but it was also revealed on the cross where Jesus Christ died for us. God is love is not simply a doctrine in the Bible. It is an eternal fact clearly demonstrated on Calvary. God has said something to us. God has done something for us. But all this is preparation for the third great fact, God does something in us. We are not merely students reading a book or spectators watching a deeply moving event. We are participants in the great drama of God's love. In order to save money, a college drama class purchased only a few scripts of a play and cut them into uh, the separate parts for each uh, participant. The director gave each player his or her individual part in order for them to start to rehearse uh, the play. But nothing went right. After an hour of miscues and mangled sequences, the cast gave up. At that point, the director sat the actors all on the stage and said, look, I'm going to read the entire play to you. So don't any of you say a word. He read the entire script aloud. And when he was finished, one of the actors said, so that's what it was all about. And when they understood the entire story, they were able to fit their parts together and have a successful rehearsal. When you read uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 16, you feel like saying, so that's what it's all about. Because here we discover what God has in mind when he devised his great plan of salvation. To begin with, God's desire is to live 
in us. He's not satisfied simply to tell us that he loves us or even to show us that he loves us. It is interesting to trace God's dwelling places as recorded in the Bible. In the beginning, God had fellowship with mankind in a personal, direct way in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. But sin broke that fellowship. Uh, and you remember in the cool of the evening how God walked with uh, Adam and, and uh, they enjoyed that communion together, that time together. But then sin entered it. And who did sin enter through? Satan. And he influenced Adam and Eve to disobey God. Now it's not so much that God wanted to rule over them. God wanted to be responsible for them and to take care of them, to express his great love for them through action, through the way that he took care of them. L look at how when God created man, they didn't have to do anything to create themselves, and they didn't have to create, uh, produce any tools or any uh, materials. God just started speaking, and something came from nowhere. And, 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 and before you know it, he had created Adam and Eve. And, and then uh, when he was creating the world, he was speaking it. And, and God can still, through his word, generate not only possibilities, but perfection. So it was necessary for God to shed blood of the animals uh, to cover the sins of Adam and Eve after they fell from the uh, image and likeness of God so that they might come back into his fellowship. One of the key words in the book of Genesis is walked. God walked with men and men walked with God. In, Gina, in uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, Enoch walked with God. In Genesis chapter nine, 6, verse 9, Noah walked with God. And in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and chapter 24, verse 40, Abraham walked with God. And by the time uh, of the events recorded in Exodus, an exchange had taken place, and God did not simply walk with men. He lived and dwelled with them. God's commandment to Israel was, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's Exodus 25 and verse 8. The first of those sanctuaries was the tabernacle. When Moses dedicated it, the glory of God came down and moved into the tent in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33 through 35. God dwelled in the camp, but he did not dwell in the bodies of the individual Israelites. Unfortunately, the nation sinned and God's glory departed in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 21. But God used Samuel and David to restore the nation. And Solomon built God a magnificent temple. And when the temple was dedicated, once again, the glory of God came to dwell in the land. Based upon what we learn in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. But history repeated itself. And Israel disobeyed God and was taken into captivity. The gorgeous temple was destroyed. One of the prophets of the captivity, Ezekiel, saw the glory of God depart from it in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 4, chapter 9, verse 3, chapter 10, verse 4, and chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. Did the glory of God ever return? Yes, in the person of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And the word became flesh 
and the tabern and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. The glory of God dwelt on the earth in the body of Jesus Christ, for his body was the temple of God, which wicked men nailed to the cross. They crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory based upon what we're taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. All of this was part of God's thrilling plan. And Christ arose from the dead and returned to heaven and, and sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in mankind. Now the glory of God now lives in the body of his children. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own. The glory of God departed from the tabernacle and the temple when Israel disobeyed God, but Jesus has promised that the Spirit will abide in us forever. John chapter 14, verse 16 makes us aware of that. With this background, we can better understand what 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 16 is saying to us. God is a spirit. He's invisible. As we're taught in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, and no man can see him with his, well, see him in his essence. That flows from the Old Testament when, when no one could see God with their eyes lest they die. Now, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. By taking on himself a, a human body, Jesus is able to reveal God to us. But Jesus is no longer here on earth. How then then does God reveal himself to the world? I'm glad you asked. He reveals himself through the lives of his children, through us, when we show his love for others. Mankind cannot see God, but they can see us. And if we abide in Christ, we will love one another. And our love for one another will reveal God's love to a needy world. God's love will be experienced in us and then be expressed through us. That's Im that, that important little word, abide or dwell, is used six times in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. It refers to to our personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. To abide in Christ means to remain in spiritual oneness with him so that no sin comes between us because sin separates us from him. Because we are born of God, we have union with Christ. But it is only as we trust him and obey his commandments that we have communion with him. Much as a faithful husband and wife abide in love, though they may be separated by miles, so a believer abides in God's love. This abiding is made possible by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. I imagine the wonder and the privilege of having God abide in us. The Old Testament Israelites would look with wonder at the tabernacle and temple because the presence of God was in that building. No man would dare to enter the Holy of Holies where God was enthroned in glory. But we have God's spirit living in us. We abide in his love 
and we experience the abiding of God in us. If a man loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 23, God, it, God's love is proclaimed in the world by the fact that God is love and he abides in us and we in him and proved at the cross on Calvary. But here we have something different, dip, uh, deeper. God's love is perfected in the believer. Fantastic as it may seem, God's love is not made perfect in angels, but in sinners saved by his grace. We Christians are now the tabernacle and the temple in which God reveal God is God, in which God dwells. He reveals his love through us to one another, to the world even. Just as Jesus, the Son of God, was given to us to die for the sins of the world, now God chooses sinners that Jesus died for to reveal God's love through. We are, uh, 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 let's see how did uh, uh, Paul put it. He says, we are, uh, let me think of it. We, we are a peculiar treasure unto God. We are very special. We are important. We are very valuable to God because it is us, even though we once were sinners, once we was lost, we were blind, but now we see. Now we're found because of God's grace is resting upon us. And through his grace now, he is able to reveal his love through us. Just as he chose his son to take upon himself the sins of the world on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, he hung, bled, and died. They took him down and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. And he went back to glory, but he left us with the instructions to take up our cross daily and follow him. Abide in his love. And his love will abide in us. So what is God doing? He's abiding in us through his love. That's all I have time for today, but... Uh, Next week, we'll come back with God Abides in this part two. You just heard part one. Next week, God Abides in this part two. So uh, make plans, put it on your, on your calendar to be sure and come back next Sunday morning and uh, be blessed. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing your glory to abide in us, your love to abide in us and using us in your service. We thank you that you chose sinners like us to reveal your great love for all of mankind through us. We thank you so much. Though we are unworthy, we thank you for making us what we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Again, thank you for joining us. We realized that you had many other choices of places and things that you could have been doing, and you chose to spend a few moments to view this video, and we thank you so much. And we pray that God will continue to bless you real good. And with that, remember to mask up, uh, practice social distancing, and uh, wash your hands often and allow God to continue to use you
to reveal his love. And with that, I'm out of here. So long.